Almost every parent with two or more offspring will tell you no two children are alike. And in this moving story from Luke chapter 15 about a man, a father, if you will, a loving father and his two sons, we'll find out that his two sons were nothing alike, and yet at the same time they were very much alike. You don't want to miss this moving story of God's love for his children. Also, we have a very special guest today who will be playing on the piano. Please enjoy yourself with his prelude. Reverend Lindsey Tuff Sr. will be at the piano today, and for your enjoyment and worship experience, I know that you will be blessed. God bless you. Welcome to Victory Baptist Church, Douglasville, Georgia. I'm Pastor James Cook. The service will begin right after the music. God bless you. Tough Senior on the piano. Were you blessed? Amen. Amen. He changed his name to Lindsay. Lindsay Tough Senior. I'm sorry, Brother Lindsay. Amen. Let's stand, let's begin or continue our time of worship by the quoting of God's Word. You'll find it on the screen or in your bulletin. Let's say it all together. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 10. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 10. You remain standing as our dear sisters lead us in worship through singing. You are to sing along with them. Hymn number 426. Victory in Jesus. <laughs>
standing. And in recognition of our youth, Youth Sunday as well as Father's Day, Brother Christopher is going to lead us in our opening prayer. Would you say amen to Brother Christopher? Amen. Thank you, Christopher. Stand right here. Would you lead us, please, sir, and thank you for doing so. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to come to your house today and worship in your name on this beautiful Father's Day. And Lord, please continue to provide and care for us as we, as we celebrate our Father's Day. Amen. 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 Thank you, Brother Christopher. God bless you. God bless you. And you may be seated. As Brother Christopher takes a seat and you're being seated, please notice in your bulletin, we're going to look at some things on the screen as well as in your bulletin. We are having Children's Church. We started that back up in the month of June. And Sister Josie Taylor is doing that. And that's strictly for children four through eight years old, and we need some volunteers in the nursery. You need to see Sister Carla or Sister Joy, and we need you to sign up today. Our June mission project is collecting water, Gatorade, coffee, things like that for our Douglas County Fire Department number six. Now, we also take love offerings for that. That is, you can give money-wise. And we'll take two offerings this morning. We'll take our first offering as the ushers come down to receive your regular tithes and offerings. And then I'm going to ask them to go back one more time for you to give to the fire department. And so anything that you give in that offering will go to the fire department. If you're writing your check out, go ahead and make it to VBC, Victory Baptist Church. Just put down in the memo on that second offering, fire department or June mission project. This morning, you were blessed to hear during the service, uh, Reverend Lindsey uh, Tufts, a senior, play for us. He'll be played again during the worship service. He was a guest with us last week, and I got to uh, uh, meet and talk with him and have lunch with him. Enjoyed a wonderful part of the day with him this last Thursday. Found out he could play that again, and I said, well, you notice we didn't have nobody on him. And uh, we came back, and he played around. So I invited him to come and play this morning. Yeah. Not only can he play the piano, but he can play that organ. I understand he can do some other uh, music. And he does pretty good for a 62-year-old. Amen? <laughs> he does pretty good for a 72-year-old. 82-year-old. He is 92 years old. Amen? <laughs> Praise the Lord. You're never too old to serve the Lord. Amen? Amen. And he has a distinguished uh, music career. He's been on stage or played the same place as Duke Ellington and some other famous uh, people that in jazz that played in his jazz band when he played during his military days in the Air Force. And so we're privileged to have him. He's just moved down and living with his daughter over in Graythorn. Uh, he moved down from Cleveland, where he was born 92 years ago, and he's been here with us since April. We're going to keep him, amen? amen. Best we can. Amen. Praise the Lord. Yes. Amen. Today is Father's Day, and we're recognizing not only our youth for Youth Sunday, who already met you at the door and helped with the bulletins, we'll be helping in uh, passing out the offering plate as well as lead us in prayer. We appreciate them. All of our youth, would you please stand this morning? All our youth, if you're 83 or younger, would you please stand? 21 and younger, would you please stand? All our youth, look at there. Amen. Give them a hand. They'll come out. Thank you for the best you God bless y'all. Y'all may be seated. Now, I want to recognize our days. And everyone... I want you to stand in honor of your daddy, whether he's still living or he's with the Lord. So would you please stand in honor of your daddy? Think about your daddy right now. Mention his name. Think about one of those good things you shared with him. Maybe sharing his name. Maybe there was something that uh, you remember in your youth or even continue to remember even these last weeks. Maybe you don't have that good of memory as maybe you wanted to. Bible says honor your father and mother and we can honor their position and we can pray for them and we can give thanks unto God. Now, if your father, if you are a father, would you remain standing and everyone else please be seated. 
Look around and see who our daddies are. Amen? Give all our fathers a warning. Amen. Dads, God bless you. We love you. We pray the Lord's blessings on you. You may be seated. We have a special gift for all the men that are present today. And that will be distributed by our youth at the back door. And so you make sure to pick that up as you leave. Church Council, we're meeting after the service next Sunday. We need to have all of you there. And I have a card here to read to the church to share with you. And um, just a note from Mary uh, Jeffries. It says, um, Dear Victory family, thank you for your acts of kindness when I really needed it. I am so blessed to go to a church which shows love, kindness, and practice what the Bible teaches to help one another. And so thank you so very much from my heart, Sister Mary Jeffries. Amen. Mary, we love you. God bless you. You may have seen uh, Sister Frankie Cook as you came in. We missed her lately, and I thought she was just doing all the things that you need to do and make the visits and after your loved one dies. But I just found out she had a broken ankle right after Brother Bailey died, so she's been recuperating. And we're glad that she's here. Amen. Praise the Lord. God bless you. And guests, we're glad that you are here. Make sure that you read the other announcements on the bulletin. We need you to sign up for Vacation Bible School. Sister Vanessa who's standing in for Sister Lynn. She's right back here. And she's always bright and cheery with some clothing like that. So you, it's easy to find her. We need you to talk to Sister Vanessa. Sign up. If you need a pen, we got the pen. And we need you to do that today. And uh, there's one other thing. Oh, yeah, Brother Ray and Sister Joy filling in for Brother Guy on the soundboard. We appreciate them so much. They were the ones that got here early this morning and turned the air conditioning on. And aren't you grateful for that? Say amen. amen. Praise amen. the Lord. Guests, thank you for being here with us. You should have gotten a guest registration card if this is your first time. Please fill that out and put it in the offering plate later on in the service. If you desire to do so, we would like to get to know you better. Would you please stand? Turn to your neighbor. If you want to shake a hand, do that. If you just want to wave a hand and smile behind your mask, do that. You just remain standing as we continue in worship, worshiping our Lord through singing. Oh, how I love Jesus.
so much. As they're coming down, I invite you to take your copy of God's Word. And for today's Bible lesson, you will find it printed in your bulletin. We are in the 15th chapter of the book of Luke. Luke chapter 15. I want to speak to you this morning on a loving father and his two boys. A loving father and his two boys. As soon as you find chapter 15, I want us to begin reading in verse 10. Luke chapter 15. I need everyone to have a Bible open. I'm looking out over the congregation, wondering who I need to come down and sit beside to help them get their Bible opened. Oh, looks like you're all doing well this morning. You're your preacher appreciates that so much. And it's not you doing it for me. You're doing it for yourselves. You bring your Bible to church because we want to teach out of it. We want to preach out of it. And you need to hold your preacher accountable. You need to open that Bible and make sure what he's saying is in the Bible and what he's preaching at least for me, sounds halfway what God is trying to say. And if I get way off the mark, you've got to call me to it. I want to preach God's Word. And that's the only reason I'm up here. And that's the only reason I'm a pastor. God called me, and I need to be obedient to Him. So thank you for helping your pastor by bringing your Bible to church, opening it up when he says, take your copy of God's Word and open to And we Luke. Chapter 15, beginning with verse 10. Likewise, I say unto you, there's joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repents. Now, this is the transition verse between verses 1 through 9 and what we'll begin reading at verse 11. In verses 1 and 2, Jesus said, Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. Now here's the scene of this entire chapter. Jesus has been meeting with the publicans that were not, not republicans now, the publicans, <laughs> the tax collectors, and the sinners. And there was a group called the Pharisees, the self-righteous Pharisees, that were saying under their breath and to one another, look at that man. If he were truly a man of God, he wouldn't be meeting with these old sinners. He would be hanging around with us righteous people. Quote, righteous in quotes. And so Jesus found that as an opportunity to tell the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and the parable that we're going to focus on, the lost son. Now, what is a parable? It is an earthly story that we can relate to that has a heavenly meaning that we need to understand. A parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning, a spiritual meaning. And so he takes the example of a man who leaves his hundred sheep out in the field to find one who is lost. And he finds it, throws it on his shoulder, comes in, got, calls all his friends around, says, Rejoice with me because my sheep that was lost, I found it. Amen and amen. They said, Woo, praise the Lord, you found that lost sheep. And then there was a lady that lost a piece of wedding attire, a little piece of silver, shekel. And she swept the whole floor looking for it. And she finally found it, one out of ten. And she finally found it. She called all her friends together and said, Rejoice with me, I have found it. So there's, there's a, a sequence here of something being lost, something being found, and the follow-up of rejoicing, okay? The owner loses it, he finds it, he shows it to his friends, and they all celebrate. And Jesus says in verse 10, Likewise, I say unto you, there's joy in the presence of the angels of God, over one sinner that repents. Sometimes we say when somebody gets saved and that they've repented and been saved, we say that the angels are rejoicing in heaven. That's not exactly what it says. It says there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels. I wonder who that is rejoicing. I wonder if it's the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
I wonder if it's the saints that have gone on before or some other angelic beings other than the angels or maybe it does include the angels. Everybody's in heaven having a good time over those who get saved. Did you know when you got saved there was some partying and celebration going on in heaven. That's what Jesus says and I believe what Jesus says, don't you? And then he says in addition to there being a sheep lost, a coin lost, we have a certain man, verse 11, who had two sons. Now remember this, it says he has two sons. Usually we focus on just one of those sons, but we're going to look at both of those sons today. And we're going to look at this particular man who is the father of these two sons, obviously. And we're going to look at the love of this father, and we're going to look at the relationship that his two sons have with this loving father. And some of us can identify, whether we're a male or female, with these characters, either the father or one of these two sons, or maybe some of us in different times in our lives can identify with all three of them. Let's see what the story says as it unfolds. And he said, a certain man, Jesus said, had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me, and he divided unto them his living. That is, the boy came to him and asked in advance for his inheritance. And the indication is that the boy is treating his daddy as if he were already dead. I want what's coming to me. Now, as the younger of the two, he gets one-third of the inheritance because the oldest gets two-thirds. And so he says, I want what's coming to me. And the younger of them say to his father, Give me the portion of goods that fall to me. And the father divided unto them his living, some to the older boy, some to the younger boy. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. We might say it in the common vernacular, wine, women, and song, he splurged it off. And don't you think that he didn't have friends to spend it on? Somebody said, if you want to have friends, just build you a pool in your backyard. You'll have friends that come over that you never knew about. If you want to have friends, just win the lottery. And I hope nobody ever wins the lottery because you're playing the lottery. We don't need to play the lottery as God's people. God will take care of our needs. And lottery is a form of gambling and it's a form of stealing. Don't play the lottery. But if you come into some money and some of your cousins hear about it, guess who starts calling you on the telephone? Guess who starts saying, we'd like to come over to your place for Christmas or we'd like to hang out with you. They want to borrow some of that money. When you have money, you seem to have friends, but they're not true friends. They're just in it for what you can, they can get out of it. And it's exactly appropriate because that's exactly what the young son wanted. He wanted what he could get out of his daddy, and he showed immaturity, he showed lack of financial responsibility, and he showed the disdain for his daddy that played out in his character, and he went and he wasted his substance with riotous living. Sometimes you read these stories of some of our professional sports athletes and how that they have a wonderful story of applying themselves. They come out of poverty. They come out of a, a, a means of living that's very restricted and their sports talent uh, gains them a contract in the pros and overnight they become multi-millionaires. Many of them learn how to use that money. They know how to spend that money. But then we read the horror stories, the sad stories, how some have misspent it, and after only three, four, five, six, or seven, the average number of years in the professional leagues, they come out and they've wasted all their money during that time. They didn't put any aside, 
and I read a very sad story of one of the professional athletes who played among the best on the championship team, and he was found out in the streets begging for money. This is the situation with this young son. And it says that he gathered the substance, went out, left his daddy, you're good as dead daddy, and he wasted his substance with riotous living. Moreover, verse 14 says, and when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land, and he began to be in want. He began to be in need. Now, most of us know what it means to be in need. Uh, we need the rent money. We need the grocery money. Now, we need the gas money. And because we don't have the gas money, we don't have the grocery money, and we don't have the rent money. We become, we know that it's becoming more and more of our society becoming in need. And then, on top of all that, a famine comes. And that's one way that God uses to judge us. Now, it's one thing to try to be frugal with your money. Spend it right. See that God is the one who's giving you everything. And then come in need because you know, well, if, if that's the way the Lord wants it and I've been frugal, I've been faithful to give my tithes and offerings, I've given to the poor, and I've been faithful to spend my other money as I should be, and God allows it, then he's got a reason for it, and God's not going to forsake his own. The old man in the psalm says, I've lived and I've become old. I've never seen God's children begging. I know that God will take care of them. But when you come in need and you look back with regret how you spent the money that you used to have and said, if I just laid up some for Satan in the savings, I'd have it now. That's a different story. Well, that's where this old boy is. He's wasted all of his money. He has spent his last dime. Now there's a famine in the land, in the land and things are tough for everybody. Now, most of us know and have a friend that when things get a little tight we might have a family member that we can go to and knock on the door and say hey we run out of sugar can we borrow a cup of sugar nobody does that anymore these days do they <laughs> when's the last time you borrowed a cup of sugar or had somebody know no, we don't do that no. we we text and say hey you got about 25 dollars out of your bar <laughs> somebody said 25 dollars might be a thousand i don't have it and so you go down your list Right? How many of you got a list, huh? All right. And so we help one another out. There's nothing wrong with that. And that's the way the church community, the church family should be. We help one another out. We got the same daddy. He's blessed us all. And when one child is in one, and then a brother or sibling in the faith ought to be able to help out if he can. But there's a famine in land. Nobody's able to help out. And it says in verse 15, and he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. Now, he left his daddy. He was out on his own. He misspent it. And now we start seeing some things happen in reverse before the bad. And it's poetic justice in a sense. He wanted to be free, but now he has to join himself to a citizen of that country. And it's a Gentile, no less, because the Gentile's occupation of that of having pigs and no Jewish person in right standing in their Jewish faith had anything to do with the swine. And he says he went and joined himself to a certain citizen of that country, and that citizen sent him into his fields to feed the swine, to feed the pigs. Now, when I was growing up in Florida, between the ages of five and ten, we had a little old place, a little old, uh, uh, framed house, that wasn't all the way constructed and, and uh, you could see the chickens under the floor sometimes through the holes in the floor. And we had a little chicken coop, but they didn't stay in the coop. They were always getting in the neighbor's stuff. And we had a little garden. We had one horse, one cow, and one pig. And my job before I went to school every morning was to get the slop bucket. Now, if you don't know what a slop bucket is, it is a bucket with a handle that mom kept up under the kitchen sink and would put the table scraps in. And because we were so poor, we didn't have that many table scraps. 
And so I was to take that slop bucket and then go by the little building outside that Daddy had, and he'd taken an old oil barrel, cut the top out of, of it off, and poured in sacks of corn, and I was to take an old scoop that he made out of a bleach bottle and cut it and made a scoop out of it, and reach down in there and get a scoop of that corn and mix it in with the slop. Every now and then, when I reached down there, my little seven, eight year old, nine, 10 year old arm, there'd be old rat down there in that corn or some other critter. And I'd have to beat it and kill it before I could get that skip to the scoop of corn. Then I walked back out in the pasture. We had a fence. I'd bend down and uh, open that fence up, walk out. And then, because the pig pen was higher, the wall of it was higher than I could reach over and dump that bucket, I'd have to put my toes in it, step up, and reach over and dump that slop bucket. By that time, the hog knew what was going on. He was climbing up on the inside of that fence, and I couldn't get over in the trough to uh, dump the, uh, dip the uh, uh, bucket, and so sometimes I'd just pour it on his head. <laughs> he didn't mind. He was a hog. That's how he lived. And that was the stinkiest, muckiest pig pen that we, I could ever imagine anybody had it. One time I bent over and did get it in the trough and the horse come up and bit me in you know where. <laughs> I know a little bit about slopping hogs and feeding them. And it's not a glorious job. But that's what I had to do before I went to school. And we had to walk a mile in the snow down there in Florida, both ways and back up here. That's what I told the children when they were little. Snowing in Florida, Daddy? Uphill both ways? Yeah, it's hard. <laughs> and verse 16 says, He would fain, that is, he longed to have his belly filled with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave him to him. Can you imagine being in such a situation that you wanted to eat what the pigs were eating? And no man would help him. Now, you and I would agree he had no one to blame but himself, right? No one to blame but himself. He had it easy in his daddy's house. And blessedly for this young man, this younger son, he came to realize that, but it wasn't until a little bit later. Look at verse 17. And when he came to himself, that means when he came to his senses, you know, sin leads us in doing unsensible things, uh, doing things that are just don't make sense. And now he comes to himself in the pig pen. And there's been many a preacher that preached a sermon that said when he came to himself in the pig pen, or pig pen salvation. And he came to himself in the pig pen. He said, how many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough to spare and I perish with hunger. He's in a bad place. You know, sometimes it's good to be in a bad place if you come to your senses. If it's been you that's made yourself, uh, that's responsible for you being in that situation. Now, parents, I don't think there's too many of us that at one time or another didn't have a prodigal child. A child that may not been living the way that they should have been. And in some way it acted like this young child. And then there's others that have had the exact example of this young child. And if it's not a child or this young son, a child like this young son, it might be a grandchild. And you wonder, what do I do? I've got a prodigal. He's left the house, he's left his friends, he's gone into a foreign country, and he's left the God of his youth. What do I do? Well, let's just back up and see what the father has done so far. The father didn't argue with the son. I'm sure he set him down and he said, son, if you do this, you can expect this to happen. Son, we don't want you to leave, son. Would you please stay? But the son is old enough to make up his mind and the father had to have confidence in who he was and who the God was that they served, and that he had to let that child make up his own mind and go. He had to let him go. He had to let him go at the expense of that child insinuating, Daddy, I don't even care if you're dead or alive. I just want what's coming to me. And that would have come to him when he was dead. And so, Daddy, 
I consider you dead. And I'm leaving you. I'm leaving this house. I know better what to do. I'm getting out of here. And he got her. And that dad had to let him go. We don't hear him arguing with his son. We don't hear him cussing his son out. We hear him giving what he deserved, what was rightfully his, and the daddy freely letting him go. Now, one of the scariest things that you and I can ever have, have happen to us is to throw our fist up to God's face in rebellion and say, God, let me go, because God will let me you go. God is not going to force any of us to worship Him. God's not going to force any of us to become part of His family. All God can do is show His merciful love and His grace to us in the sacrifice of His Son, the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and say, here, this is how much I love you. And if that doesn't convince you, nothing else will. Amen. Sometimes when I'm witnessing to somebody, they say, well, God really loves me. Why doesn't He show me? And I've just gone through the gospel with them, how that Jesus died for them, was buried, and shed his blood on their behalf when they should have died and went to hell, but Jesus took hell for them on the cross. And then they say, well, if he really loves me, what is he to show me? I mean, what more can God do than to die for you in your place and take the hell that you deserve and the punishment for your sin that you deserve and die on that cross and say, I love you, and though I've never sinned, I'll take your sin for you and die in your place. No greater love can a man demonstrate than to lay down his life for his friend. And this father had to be confident in himself, established in himself, knowing where he stood, where God stood with him, and he had to let that son go. And he had to let that son find out for himself and learn the lesson the hard way. Some parents want to follow them, these helicopter parents, and want to be with them even in the pig pen and help bail them out of the pig pen. Mamas and daddies, sometimes you've got to let them get in the pig pen and leave them alone in the pig pen. And let them learn their lesson. But you bail them out of jail, you pay another doctor for their drug problems, you keep paying their bills for them, taking care of their responsibilities, and you wind up with a 50, 60, 70 year old child still in your house, still living off of you. You've got to let them go, know who you are, know who God is, and let them wind up in the pig pen sometimes. Don't always be there to bail them out. And you know, the best place to start with that is while they're young. Don't you clean up their room for them when you told them to clean that room. Don't you let them get by not doing their homework when that's supposed to be done. Don't you say, okay, you can get on the computer. It's okay when you told them no, they could not until they did this. And if they pitch a fit, you just stand there and stomp your feet, throw your arms and yell and pitch a bigger fit. <laughs> Don't let your child control you. Show them who the adult is. Go to the pig pen and let them learn the lesson of the pig pen. Now he says again, verse 17, he came to himself and he says to himself, he's thinking now, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to spare and I'm here perishing with hunger. It just doesn't make sense. I'm the son, they're the servants and the servants are better off than the son is. And it's not my daddy's fault. It's my own fault. You ever made a mistake like that? You ever looked in the mirror and wanted to kick yourself? Said, how in the world did you do that? Well, that's the first step. You're coming to your senses. Now start thinking about how that you need to reverse where uh, the steps that you've taken and to get back where you used to be. Well, here's what he does. He says, I will arise. <laughs> that's the first thing you do. You get up. Stop your moaning, stop your whining, stop your crying. Get up and do something. Move. And he says, I will arise 
and I will go to my father. What's he been doing all this time? He's been going from his father. He's been running from his father. Now he says, I'm going back to my daddy. Woo! That's another sermon right there. When we turn back to the father. And so he says, I'm going back to my father and I will say unto him. He's got this speech planned out. You ever had to make an apology like that? <laughs> You've got it all planned. You said, what? What am I going to say? i got to say it just right because I, I need to be just right. And what if they respond this way? And then, then what am I going to say? And you got that speech all written out in your heart and mind. You may even put it down on a sheet of paper. And he might even wrote, written it down on a piece of script and looked at it every time he's walking, taking a step back toward home. He says, I will say in him, Daddy, I've sinned against heaven and I've sinned before you. And that's right. He had. He had sinned against heaven, against God, and he had sinned against his daddy. And then he asked, and I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And I'm not sure, but I'm sure he had one of those Hebrew words in there for please. Please make me one of thy servants. So he's now humbled himself. He's turning in the right direction. He got up. He's turning in the right direction. He's going to tell his daddy how sorry he is. He's got conviction and contrition of heart. And he's going to say it. And he's not going to use the word but. He's making an apology. When you make an apology, you never say, I'm sorry I did this, but it was because you did this or that. That's not an apology. That's justifying your action. He has no justification for what he did, and therefore he has no argument for that. And you won't see the word but or and in there, any kind of conjunction that goes back to him trying to justify his actions. He says, I'm so sorry that I'm not even worthy to be your servant. But would you, in your mercy and pity, look on me and hire me? So he arose. That's his plan. That's what he's going to say. So he arose. How many of you got the red letter Bible? All right, you see it's all red letters. Jesus is telling this parable. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees are hanging on. They heard the one about the lost sheep, the one among a hundred. They heard the one about the lost shekel, the piece of silver, one among ten. And now they're hearing about one-on-one -on -one relationship. There was the sheep, there was the, there was the shekel, now here's the son. And he arose and came to his father, Jesus said, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him, now listen to this, and had compassion. And the daddy ran, and he fell on the boy's neck, and he kissed him. Now, in some of my commentaries, I read that the custom back in the, the, those days, men like his daddy didn't run. You, you don't run to something to show to somebody that you're, you're behind or you're in a haste. Another thing is, he's out watching for his boy and sees him afar off. That is, the boy didn't have to walk down the road, turn into the front gate, walk up on the porch, and have to knock on the door, and his daddy come to the door. No, that daddy was out there somewhere where he had good vision, a good sight, where he could see afar off, and probably doing this every day, hoping his boy would come back. And he sees a figure in the distance. And at first, in the haze of that hot oriental sun and the heat rising off of that dirt, it's just a little wavy, but he knows that somebody's coming. And he keeps his eyes fixed on this figure. And he starts walking toward it. And the figure becomes a little clearer as it gets closer. And he notices a certain gait in the walk of this figure. And he notices this gait is one like his younger son used to have. And he begins to pick up his pace and he gets a little closer. And he notices a boy about the same age as his boy would be. But his clothing is worn out and ragged. His hair is overgrown. His beard is out, way out. And he's disheveled looking. And even some scratches. But he looks and he knows it's his boy. And as if he sees that it is his boy, he begins running after him. And that boy looking up from his old head hanging down 
in sorrow and regret, rehearsing his speech, looks up and sees his father figure coming after him. And that old boy stops in his tracks and he wonders if his daddy's going to hug him and is going to hit him. And he just stands there and the daddy comes up to him and the boy begins to rehearse his speech. And in the midst of his speech, his daddy just reaches around and grabs him and starts kissing him all over and says, Son, son, you're home. I love you. It's so good to see you. Amen. Oh, the love of God that waits on a returning child. That's who this father represents. heaven and in your sight no more worthy to be called your son but the father said to his servants hey boys you go get the best robe and put it on him and they put a robe on him a nice robe the best robe that they had in the house in exchange for those old dirty rags and I'm so glad that when we get saved the Bible says that he exchanges his beauty for our ashes. That he robes us in his robes of righteousness. And not only when we are saved are we cleansed on the inside, but we're clothed on the outside. And when God looks at us, he doesn't see us. He sees his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That rich royal, royal regalia that he's dressed out in. And we are in Christ and Christ is in us. And he says, get that best robe. And they put it on the boy. Then he said, listen, not only the robe, I want you to put a ring on his hand. Or a robe of righteousness and a ring of identification. It's kind of like the wedding ring. When you see that ring, you know that I've said I do to one woman and I don't to every other woman. It's a ring of identification. I'm married. This identification identified this boy as being the son of of the father not a servant and he says not only a ring on his finger but I want you to put some new shoes on his feet meaning that he now has the right to enter in to the father's house the slaves the servants they didn't wear those kind of robes they didn't have a ring identifying themselves as the father's son and they certainly didn't have shoes to walk around in they worked in the bare feet but this boy he now had a pair of new shoes. What is the daddy trying to say? Son, I love you and you're back in the fold. We have found you and you've come back home. And then he says in verse 23, he says to his servants, bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be married. For this my son was what? Dead and is alive. Watch these contrasts now. He was dead and alive. He was lost, but now he is found, and they begin to be married. What is it? They're having a party. What did Jesus say? When they found the lost sheep, they celebrated. When the woman found her lost wedding silver, they celebrated. And Jesus said, when one repents and becomes saved, their celebration in the presence of the angels in heaven. They're doing exactly what Jesus said needs to be done when the lost is found. Oh, what a joyous time it was. This fatted calf, this was a special calf that they kept for special occasions. This was something that they would use during the Day of Atonement and the special feast of Israel. But can you think of anything more special? Then your son or your daughter, your child that has been living a raunchous life, that has been living wickedly, that has forsaken the home and forsaken God, and then one day walks into the house and says, Mama, Daddy, I've sinned against God and I've sinned against you. Please forgive me. I've come back. I want to tell you I love you. Would you let me just stay on the front porch for a place to stay? Oh, my child, you're my child. You don't sleep on the front porch. You sleep in the best bed. You don't have to eat the table scraps. I'm fixing you a big meal. I'm calling you brothers and sisters. I'm calling you daddy. I'm calling you cousins. Oh, we've been praying for you in your home. Oh, praise the Lord. Let's have a party tonight. Have you 
you've ever had a child come back like that, you know what I'm talking about. You know what this daddy's talking about. If you're ever needing a child to come back, this is how you welcome him back. The daddy didn't dress him down. The daddy didn't ask him where he spent all that money. The daddy didn't ask him why you're looking like you're looking. The daddy didn't give him the what for. The loving father welcomed, welcomed him back home. And that's what God is waiting on for some of you. That's what some of you may be waiting on for your children. And that's how we're to respond. But you remember we begin this reading in verse 11 where it says, a man had two sons. What about the other boy? Let's keep reading. Verse 25 says, now his elder son was in the field. And he came and drew nigh to the house. He heard music. And he heard dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked, hey, what's going on? And he said to him, Oh, thy brother's come. He's home now. Thy father hath killed the fatted calf because he hath received him safe and sound. I used to listen to a preacher, well, still do, but he's with the Lord, Dr. Oliver B. Green. And he had a 15 and sometimes 30 minute radio program here in the Atlanta area and all over the United States at one time. And he would preach and teach very fast. And he would close his service or his radio program out, his Bible teaching, with a prayer. And he almost always said something like this, and dear Lord, please save the soul that is near to hell right now. Please save the soul that is near to hell right now. And what I want you to see is in verse 27, this servant said to the older son, he says, he's received him back home safe and sound. Before it was too everlastingly late, the boy was plucked as a brand from the fire and he's come back home safe and sound. And that's what God wants for us. To realize that we can come back home safe and sound. That's what we pray for our prodigal children. That they get back home safe and sound. That's what the preacher and other Christians pray for the lost. That they might be saved and they come back home safe and sound. Before it's too everlastingly late. Now how did this older son respond? Look at it. it said, and he was angry. And would not go in. And this was a great insult to his father and those who saw it. His father's throwing a party, and the oldest son refuses the invitation. It was a great insult to him. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. Look at this father again. He's got one son that's left, and he's come back home, and he could have dressed him down, but he didn't. Now he has another son that has insulted him by not accepting the invitation to the party, but the Bible says the Father also deals gently with him and entreats him. Let's hear what he has to say. And he answered him, and answering the son, said to him, his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment, and yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this, now listen to how he refers to his brother, as soon as this, Thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots. Thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. Now you remember verses 1 and 2 of chapter 15 when we started? Jesus had been hanging out with the publicans and the sinners. Remember that? The publicans and sinners, both of them, that's redundant. Both of them were sinners. They were despised especially the publicans because they were the tax collectors and they cheated when they collected the taxes and the sinners but then there was another group who was that? who were they the pharisees these are who these two boys represent the 
young boy represents these sinners, these publicans, and these self-righteous Pharisees represent, or this boy represents these self-righteous Pharisees. In his self-righteousness, he said, Daddy, I kept your commandments. I never did anything wrong. I live by the rules. And just like the Pharisees, he had an outward appearance of religion and a relationship with his daddy. But as Jesus called them, they were whitewashed sepulchers full of dead men's bones. And this boy, as he demonstrates now, was dirty on the inside, wicked on the inside, just as much and even more as his younger son thinking that his self-righteousness earned him a relationship with his daddy. Son, you're ever with me, and all that I had is yours. It was meet or appropriate or fitting that we should make merry and be glad, for here it is again. For this, your brother, your brother. These publicans and sinners are your brothers of the house of Israel, God's chosen. They are your kin. He was dead, and he's alive again. He was lost, and he's found. in the coin the owner goes looking for what he's lost in the parable of the son he realizes he's lost and he comes back to his owner his daddy we never know what happened to this older son representing the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the self-righteous we know that they perished in their self-righteousness. It's like the publican who prayed and the sinner who prayed and the sinner knelt down on the sidewalk in the midst of the people. He smote his breast and said, Oh God, be merciful unto me, a sinner. But the Pharisee looked down his nose at the publican who prayed that humble prayer, one of asking mercy, and said, Oh God, I'm glad I'm not like he. Jesus observing the two praying, he says one of them left justified and it wasn't the Pharisee but the publican. Be up and out just as well as being down and out. Everybody needs Jesus. Left the 99 to come and seek you. The Father waits for you to return. It's a terrible thing to be lost. But it's a wonderful thing to come to your senses and arise and go to your Father. I had a very unusual and unnerving and upsetting thing happen in our house. She had gone grocery shopping and I had remained at the house to do some yard work. About the time she was to come home, it started raining, so I went and sat in a chair inside our garage. I just remained there knowing that it was about time for her to arrive and sure enough, she comes up in the van and rather than pulling in our driveway, goes up to the left side of our house and then pulls into the garage. Instead of pulling into the garage, as I expected, and I was going to help her with the groceries, she just pulled straight up to the top of the driveway. But I noticed another car with a woman in it pull up behind her. And so I looked, and I didn't recognize the lady. I got up, and I walked toward Carla. And uh, I looked at Carla, looked at the lady, and I gave her, like, who's that? Carla says, I don't know. And so I walk up to the lady's window. She looks unassuming, uh, harmless, and she rolls the window down. I said, yes, ma'am. May I help you? 
And she says, kind of a little bit nervously, breathing just a little bit shallow, she says, I need to pull in my carport. And she spoke plainly, and she meant what she said, and she still had the car in gear, and she had her foot on the brake as if she was waiting for Carla to pull a little bit further up so she could get in behind her and pull into our garage. And of course, I asked her, I beg your pardon? She said, I'm waiting to pull into my garage. And I said, you think that's your garage? She said, yes, this is my home. I want to pull into my garage. She, I need to pull up. And I said, ma'am, would you please put your, uh, uh, gear, uh, your stick shift in park? And she started going back and forth, back and forth, not being able to do it, letting her foot off the brake a little bit. Scared me as if I thought she was going to lunge into Carla's car. I said, ma'am, let me help you. So at that time, I reached across and put it in park. And I said, would you please turn the car off? And uh, she fumbled with the keys, and I said, let me hear. Let me help you uh, turn the keys off. And I turned them off and took them out of the ignition. And I put them in my pocket. And she didn't react too badly or anything. And I said, uh, ma'am, what's your name? She gave me her name. I said, uh, are you married? No. I said, well, where do you live? She said, I live right here. I need to get into my house. I need to pull in the car. In the car. And I looked up at Carla. I said, call 911. Tell them we need an ambulance out here or some medical assistance. And so Carla did that, and then I got the phone, and I tried to explain to 911 what was going on, and I said, you might need a policeman also. This time, Carla's taking the groceries into the house by herself, and the woman says, why is that woman taking uh, groceries into my house? And I tried to explain to her as calmly as I could, ma'am, that's our house. I tried to ask her questions to distract her, but she was still determined that was her house. Uh, she got out of the car and said, I'm going into my house. I said, ma'am, that's, that's not your house. That, that's our house. I, I think, I'm trying to help you. She said, would you give me my keys back? I said, I'm on. I said, no, ma'am. And she walked into our house and stepped in, and then that's when she started realizing a little bit that maybe it wasn't her house. And she came back out. Paramedics arrived. They asked her a whole bunch of questions. Please arrive. At that time, she started coming around herself, and she said that where she lived, and it was down the street. Now, she was a neighbor, but she lived in a basement apartment with some neighbors that we knew. We didn't know her. She was a tenant. And the most that we could find out is that she'd been working out in that sun all day at a yard sale, and we surmised that she'd had a little bit of sunstroke or something. I went to the neighbors and told them about that, but then they said she had been uh, showing signs of that, and they understood and expressed our appreciation. But it was the hardest thing. It was an upsetting thing, not in the sense that you were real upset, but upset to this person. She was totally oblivious to where she was. She was lost. But the thing is, she thought she was in the right place. The scripture says there's a way that seems right in the man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And I thought to myself, there would be some driveways that if she pulled up into it and said that that was her house, she wouldn't live to talk about it. You just don't pull up people's places and start walking in their house. Some of us may think we're living the right life. We've pulled in the right driveway. And this is your house. This, this old boy went out and he lived high on the hog and wound up eating with the hogs. Well, ain't your home. As a Christian, we're just passing through. And as a lost person, you won't be here forever either. It's either heaven or hell. And the Father has everything that you need. There are people that live in this world today that think God owes them everything. And God says, help yourself. 
And when they come to the end, they find themselves without anything living in a world that is experiencing a famine. Come to your senses. Come to your right mind. And arise and go to Jesus. Look to the man who is waiting there at the end of your road that will come and meet you who's been waiting patiently and lovingly all this time. Would you please stand with me? What love our Father has for us. What patience our Father has for us. He told that boy, all that I have is yours. It's all yours. And Jesus said, the Father's given me everything and I give it unto you. We don't have to steal it from him. We don't have to demand it from him. He'll give it to us in due time. It's ours in Jesus Christ. And when you have Jesus, you have it all. Sister Vanessa is going to come up here and lead us in a hymn of invitation. And if you've never given your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ, I ask you to do it right now. Sister Vanessa, you come on up. And as I lead you in prayer, be ready to sing and be ready to move when I say amen. Father, thank you for being that loving Father. Thank you, Lord, that you did send Jesus to come into this world to mingle and to love on the publicans and the sinners, which we all are. That you've come to find us, one among a hundred, one among ten, one on one, that those of us who were lost can be found. Those of us who are dead in our trespasses and sins might be made alive. Father, if there's one here this morning that's never given their heart to Jesus, I pray that you would call them. And Father, if there's those who've given their heart to Jesus, they're saved, they're willing to be baptized, they want to be a part of this church, this is the time to come. And Father, we pray it in Jesus' name. And may we be like that young boy, that we come to our senses, that we arise, and that we go to our Father. And all God's people say, Amen. 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 Sister Vanessa, would you lead us? The music's playing. I am thine, O oh Lord. I'll meet you down front. Would you come? take two offerings. First time we go by, we're going to take the regular tithes and offerings. Second time we go by, we're going to uh, take the offering for June missions, the fire. And brother... Uh, fire department. Fire department. <laughs> Not for a fire, for the fire demon. <laughs> Amen. Brother Michael, would you lead us in that prayer, please? Heavenly Father, Lord, we want to say thank you for this beautiful, wonderful that you've given to us, Father. Today, rejoicing in your name, Lord. Thank you so very much for all the things, for all the beautiful things that you have done for us, Lord. For your blessings that you bestow upon us each and every day, Father. Lord, we thank you, thank you, thank you for your love, your grace, and your mercy, and for you for giving us life and giving it to us more abundantly, Father. Please take this offering as the furtherance of your kingdom, Father, and to bring lost souls to come to know you, Lord. We thank you for this wonderful, beautiful, awesome that you've given to us, Father. Let us rejoice and be glad in your name, Lord, and let us give you the praise, honor, and glory. In your precious and powerful name we pray, amen. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Have you enjoyed the music on the piano this yes. morning? Yes. going to give you a tangible way to express that appreciation. We're going to take three offerings this morning. Don't you ever say that New, uh, 
or that Victory Baptist Church doesn't give you an opportunity to give. <laughs> Again, Brother Lindsay and I had lunch this week, and I invited him. He's he's a trained musician. He's he's talented. He's got gifts, and he willingly came. I want us to show our appreciation to him. And he's got a little. I put over here an offering plate, and I'd like for you to come by and meet Brother Lindsay. I'm going to ask him to keep on playing, and I think he can nod to you and acknowledge your uh, appreciation and you when you come by. And this is the way I want you to do it. I want you to come by the center aisle. Lindsay, if you would, just a little bit like I got some. Come by this way and then go back up that way, and the men will get your gift going out. So the youth that will be passing out the gifts, go ahead and find your place. If you're going to write a check out, make it to Brother Tufts, okay? Lindsay, L-I-N-D-S-E, Y, T-U-F-T-S, and it's in your bulletin. Make it out to him, or I guess you can write cash or give cash, but don't make it out to the church. Just make it out to him, if you will. And it's just a love offering. If you can do it, you can. If you can't, you can't. I understand that. But do come by and tell him how much you appreciate him. Would you do that? Let's stand. And then I hope everybody will come by and call me by Brother Lindsay's piano. And let's have the closing word of prayer. And uh, I'm going to ask uh, Brother Randy, if you would, would you ask the Lord's blessings on us? Don't forget, you've got a Heavenly Father always there for you. I love you. Brother Randy, please. Father, thank you. Yes. Yes. I hope you get to see him without his mask on. He's got a beautiful smile, and like all good men, a nice goatee. <laughs>